Hi, my name is Dr. Anthony Lamar and I'm a cardiothoracic surgeon. Today we're going to talk about mitral valve replacement surgery. Before we get started though, let's review the anatomy of the heart and then describe the operation. Okay, this is a model of the heart here. I like to think of the heart in terms of sides. This is the right side, right atrium, right ventricle, and this is the left side, left atrium, left ventricle. Blood will classically go from the right atrium to the right ventricle, left atrium to the left ventricle. Now, between the left atrium and the left ventricle is a valve. It's called the mitral valve, and it actually works like a one-way door. The mitral valve is depicted in this image here by that white structure here. Once again, left atrium, mitral valve, and left ventricle. The mitral valve works like a one-way door. Basically, when the valve opens, blood can go through from the left atrium to the left ventricle, but when the valve closes, blood should stay in either the left atrium and left ventricle. Now, if someone's going to have mitral valve replacement surgery, there are some common indications. Number one, mitral valve stenosis, and that actually is when the valve is hard to open. So what ends up happening is the left atrium here has to push really hard to get the blood through. In the United States, this is not actually very common, but one of the common reasons for mitral valve stenosis would be rheumatic heart disease. That's a, that's a process where the valve becomes really thickened and it's hard to open. Another indication for replacing the mitral valve would be mitral valve regurgitation. That essentially is when you have a leaky valve. So essentially what happens is the blood goes from the left atrium through the mitral valve into the left ventricle. But because the valve is leaking, the blood will go backwards into the left atrium. What ends up happening is over time, the left atrium gets bigger, and bigger is not better. Another indication for replacing the mitral valve, which is rising in, in prevalence, is mitral valve endocarditis. And that's when you have an infection of the valve. When the valve becomes infected, de depending on how bad the infection is, the valve can be, become either stenotic or you can have regurgitation. And if it gets bad enough, you'll have to have the valve replaced. Now, I just want to emphasize the discussion today is going to be just on mitral valve replacement. There is another option, which is mitral valve repair, and that has other indications, and I'm not going to get to that today. Okay. Before we get started on how this is replaced, I just want to tell you that before going to the operating room, a discussion has to happen between the surgeon and the patient on what type of valve that you're replacing the native valve with. There's two types. There's a mechanical valve, a valve that will literally last forever, or should, and there's a tissue valve, and that's a valve that comes from either a pig or a cow. Now the mechanical valve is great in that it should last forever, literally should outlive the patient, but the problem is that it requires, or the issue is that it requires a blood thinner. The patient will be, have to be on daily medication to keep their blood thin so that there are no blood clots form that can occlude the, the valve. Now, when you take these blood thinners, that potentially can put the patient at risk for injury, bleeding. It also requires the patient to get blood tested, depending on the medication, get blood testing on a, on a, on a fairly frequent basis to make sure their blood levels are, are appropriate. Now, there are medications that don't require blood checking, uh, blood uh, monitoring, level monitoring, so that is one uh, option as well. The other option is a tissue valve, as I mentioned, for a pig or a cow. The benefit of this valve is that it does not require anticoagulation, but the negative is that it will last somewhere between 10 and 15 years, and depending on the patient's age, they may require another operation to replace the valve. So that discussion with the surgeon is critical between the surgeon and the patient prior to going to the operating room. Okay, once that discussion is had and the patient gets, got, gets to the operating room, the first thing is they'll go to sleep, once they're sleeping, they'll be prepped and draped for surgery, which essentially means they'll be sterilized, their skin, and they'll be draped ap ap appropriately for surgery. Now, there are multiple approaches to actually replacing the mitral valve. There is a sternotomy, the traditional approach, through the sternum. There's also minimally invasive approaches, where you can actually go in between the ribs. Now, depending on which approach you do, the surgery will be a little bit different. But let's take the traditional approach, which is going through the sternum. Once the patient is, has a sternotomy performed, their sternum is exposed, and there's retractors placed, then the patient will get placed on what's referred to as the heart-lung machine. This actually takes over for the heart and lungs and allows the heart to rest. Then the patient will get medication so the heart's not moving. 
At that point, you'll gain access to the left atrium. There are multiple approaches to getting to the left atrium, which I'm not going to get into, but essentially, you get access to the left atrium, and you, can, you get a good exposure to the mitral valve. Once you see the valve, you analyze it and confirm that the replacement's the appropriate surgery. There are two leaflets to the valve. There's an anterior leaflet and a posterior leaflet. Classically, you resect or remove a part of the anterior leaflet. You'll size the valve, which essentially means you're determining what new size the new valve will be. You'll place sutures through the annulus of the valve, which is where the valve sits. You'll, you'll then obtain your appropriate valve, the size, place your sutures through the valve, and then bring the valve into the annulus or where the valve is going to sit. You'll then tie your valve down and confirm that it's correctly seated. Once you're happy with the valve position, you can close the left atrium. At that point, you're prepared to come off the heart-lung machine. Once you're off the heart-lung machine, you can assess the valve, or actually prior to coming off the heart-lung machine, you're, you're assessed the valve. And once you're happy, you come off the heart-lung machine and essentially close the chest and go back, go, go to the intensive care unit. Now, we do these operations all the time, but there are risks involved. There's risk of infection, there's risk of bleeding, there's even a risk of death. These are classically low risk, but that will actually deter be determined based on the patient's risk factors. Also, if you're doing multiple other, other parts of the operation, they can also increase your risk as well. For example, if you're replacing more than one valve, or if you're doing another part of the operation like revascularization, otherwise referred to as coronary artery bypass grafting. If you're doing more than one thing, that could increase your risk as well. Okay. Classically, after the patient gets to the intensive care unit, they'll spend either one or two days in the intensive care unit, and then they'll spend approximately three or four days in a regular room afterwards. So they're in the hospital probably five or six days after surgery. Then they'll go either home or rehab based on how they're feeling and how they're doing. Okay, this is a brief description of a patient getting mitral valve replacement surgery. If you have any questions or comments, please let me know. Thank you very much.